a, uh, it is truly a blessing. I, I thank God for my family every day. And I appreciate so much the opportunity to speak with you this morning. Um, and the uh, spring congregation, as well as this Contending for the Faith lectureship every year, has been a highlight of my year uh, for several years now, uh, quite a few years back. And it's a privilege for me to be able to participate. And uh, I always uh, question myself. I, I'm not sure if I enjoy the lessons more or the fellowship. They're both great. And I wish we could do this even more often than we do. And my topic for this morning is teach us to pray. And this was an important topic in the, uh, uh, to the new Christians there in the, the beginning of the New Testament period. But it's uh, equally important to us today, and especially for the new Christian. If you don't have a background in uh, worship attendance and suddenly called on, and probably a lot of you are in this position, that the day you were baptized, they called you up to lead a prayer. Uh, that's happened to a lot of men I've seen over the years, and that's not a good way to do it, but it happens. We need to learn how to pray. Praying is not just a matter of saying the right words. There's, there's just more to it than that. And my first thought on considering this lesson course was to go to what's called the Lord's Prayer. And, uh, and I will do that, but a little bit later. I want to spend a considerable amount of time with that model. But we need to look at, first of all, who can pray expecting God's uh, response? What are we to pray for? And how are we to pray? All three of those points are very important to our prayer life. And we'll look first, at all, first of all at who can pray expecting a response from God. And I kept adding that expecting a response to God because a lot of people pray. And I don't know how high that prayer goes because they're not in the right kind of a relationship with God. And I'm going to summarize this point really pretty briefly. Uh, but only those are who are in a right relationship with God have a right or the privilege of answered prayer. John 9, verse 31 says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. In Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, Behold, Jehovah's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither is ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you. To determine if you're in a right relationship with God requires that you examine yourself in the light of God's word. And that's really as far as I'm going to go with that because Brother Jose is going to talk about this afternoon to examine yourself. So I don't want to get off into his lesson. But just be aware that we have to get ourselves in a right relationship with God in order for him to receive uh, and answer our prayers. So let's then get right on into what we are to pray for or what can we pray for. Matthew chapter 6 Jesus goes through a fairly lengthy condemnation of the type of prayers that many of the religious leaders of the day were accustomed to, to making. In Luke, um, uh, we have this, Luke chapter 11, verse 1. It said, it came to pass uh, when he was praying, as Jesus was praying in a certain place, he ceased, and his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. Now, with that, let me introduce to you then the model prayer, as it's recorded in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Now, you notice I didn't say the Lord's Prayer. I said the model prayer. Jesus didn't tell his disciples, you pray this prayer. 
He didn't give them those words. These are the words you're supposed to use. It's not his prayer. He's not praying for himself, and he's, he's not praying for the disciples. He's showing them how they are to pray, giving them a model, an example, a pattern. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 tells us very plainly, he says, After this manner pray ye. And in fact, in verse 7, just prior to getting into this uh, model prayer, um, we have the admonition to uh, against vain repetition. Now, many in the religious world today have memorized this prayer. They call it the Lord's Prayer. They repeat it often in worship and in, in times of stress. And that's the very thing that this model prayer was designed to prevent. Namely, a rote or memorized prayer. You don't need to go to a prayer book to read a prayer. You don't need to memorize this, this model prayer. Use it for an example. Now, this brief example is one of such, such beauty and thought and language that it, along with uh, John chapter 3, verse 16, and Psalm 23, are, are probably the best-known scriptures in the whole Bible. Now let's read this uh, model prayer in Matthew 6, 9 through 13. It's very brief. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And amen. So let's look at those phrases a little bit more in, in depth. The, um, first of all, this is a new way of addressing God. Under the old law, in the Old Testament, God is addressed as creator, almighty God, Jehovah, the great God, God of Abraham, uh, in various forms like that. But his disciples, God's believers, were known as, they were servants. They were servants under the old law. So there was different terminology used in prayer. Now under the new law, under the covenant of Christ, we are regarded as God's children. So Christians then can properly call God our Father. Because we've come into his family. We're part of his family. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17 says, For as many as were led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For we have received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, of God and joint heirs with Christ. That is a great privilege for those of us who are Christians to be called the children of God. <clears throat> and starting off a prayer that way, does that not restrict the use of this model prayer to God's children? Who has the right to call God their father? Who are God's children? Well, of course, Jesus makes it clear that Christians should have a father-child relationship with God. In other words, they, He is our Father. And since God is man's true and only spiritual Father, it's improper, uh, in fact, it's sinful, to use that title spiritually of any man. Jesus made that plain in Matthew 23 and verse 9, where He said, Call no man your father here on earth. The one your father is in heaven. Your father is the one who is in heaven. That's your only spiritual father. Now I realize God is the God of the whole world, sure. Uh, but he's the father of only those who are born again of the spirit of God and the word. So when you come to God in prayer, you can approach him as you would a father. 
But don't come to God with fear or guilt or thinking that God is looking for an excuse to bang you over the head with a gavel. This is your loving Father. You come to Him with boldness. Now that's confidence, not arrogance. Hebrews 4 and verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now another thing that you notice when you first start this prayer out is our Father is who it's addressed to. And that's an important point. It's not addressed to an idol. It's not addressed to the Virgin Mary. It's not addressed to the saints. It's not even addressed to Jesus Christ. It's addressed to God the Father. And uh, you hear prayers on the radio, especially all the time, of people praying to Jesus or Mary or some, some saint. That doesn't follow the model prayer. Then he says, Our Father which art in heaven. In scriptures, that term heaven is used in three different ways. Uh, one is the skies above the earth, you know, where you see the clouds and the birds. Uh, it's referenced that way in Hosea 2, verse 18, Genesis 1, 26, uh, Acts 1, verse 9 through 11. The second way that it's uh, referenced as heaven is in outer, that outer space where you have the planets and the moon and the stars. And that's referenced in Genesis 1, verses 14 through 18, and also Matthew 24, 29. The term heaven is spoken in Deuteronomy chapter 10 through 14 is the third way that it's used. And as the heaven of heavens is the term that it uses there. But the Apostle Paul refers to it as the third heaven in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 2. And this is the eventual destination of every Christian where Christ now dwells. And when he comes again, he'll take us there to be, to enjoy all that he has for us. This is the eternal dwelling place of Jehovah God. And Matthew 5, 16, uh, Matthew 12, 50, numerous passages in Revelation referring to this as the, the, the dwelling place of Jehovah God. It's part of a spiritual realm that has no spiritual beginning or end. No, <laughs> not spiritual anyway. It is no beginning and no end. It is not a created place. And the Bible encourages, um, the Bible recognizes the omnipresence of God. God is everywhere and we realize that. But when regarded as Father, His personality is located in heaven. And our faith is heaven-centered. Christ's teaching, uh, uh, there's a great deal of teaching about heaven, emphasis on heaven. And of course, that's what we're all striving for as Christians is to go to heaven. It's the dwelling place of the Father. It's the ultimate home of the righteous and the source of all blessing. And Jesus says for us to hallow God's name when we pray. That's not a term that we're real familiar with. We don't run across that in everyday uh, conversation. But the hallowed be thy name means holy and reverent is your name. So God's name is to be reverenced, treated as holy, honored first before all else. That means that you have to approach God then with reverence and humility and worship. That his name is worthy to be praised. And we can only come to the true spirit of prayer as we hallow the name of God. I think that's one reason for the prohibition against using the Lord's name in vain. Deuteronomy 5 and verse 11 says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. God's name is so to be revered, so holy, that it is sinful just to use his name in vain. And the top priority of our prayers belongs to the things of God. 
and not to the things of men. Psalms 113 and verse 3 is from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. So when we pray, Jesus wants us to, first of all, to worship and revere the name of God the Father. In fact, we uh, hallow the name of God when we honor His Word, His church, His doctrine, His Son, His laws, and His name. Then He says, Thy kingdom come. While Jesus was here on earth, He was preparing mankind for the coming of the kingdom. He says, The kingdom is at hand. In Matthew 10, verse 7, Jesus told his disciples there, he said, go and preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then a little later in Mark chapter 7, 9, verse 1, he told them there, he says, Verily I say unto you that some of them that are standing here today will not taste of death until they've seen the kingdom of God come with power. So the kingdom was very shortly to come. And some of those people living there were going to see the kingdom come in its power. So whatever the kingdom was or is has already come. But what is the kingdom? Well, just a casual reading of Matthew 16, verses 18 and 19, demonstrates that the church and the kingdom are one and the same. As Jesus said there, he said, I will build my church and I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. He's talking about the same thing. The church and the kingdom are one and the same. So naturally, those disciples were instructed to pray for the coming of the kingdom. Later, when the kingdom, the church was established in Jerusalem there on that first day of Pentecost following Christ's resurrection, when there were about 3,000 baptized, it says the time had come to pray for the kingdom to spread over all the earth. The kingdom is here now. And it's our obligation to pray for and to work toward the spread of the kingdom. Since the church and the kingdom have been established, pray for the spread of the kingdom. David mentioned earlier in complimenting my family, and I appreciate that. But can you imagine this country where if we had even half of the people who were honoring God and willing to accept God, pray to God, what a different place this would be than what we have. Then he says, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Men may know the will of God only through study of his word and the resulting renewing of the mind. Romans 12 and verse 2 be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4, it says, Who will have all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. The will of God is that people would obey His law and be holy. The word will here has reference to His law and to what would be acceptable to him. So we, if when we pray that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, what we're praying for is for the law, his revealed will to be respected and obeyed. He says, as it is in heaven. Apparently it is perfectly obeyed in heaven. And we need to work toward having it perfectly learned and obeyed here on earth. Now, if you notice, the first three petitions in this model prayer, the first one is that we should obey his law and be holy. And the word will here, I'm getting off of my, my, my schedule here, the name should be, his name should be glorified, his kingdom established, and his will be done. By placing these first in the model prayer shows the emphasis on the importance of these three items. These should be first in our heart and in our petitions before uh, coming to God in prayer. And the next phrase he uses is, uh, give us this day our daily bread. 
Bread, of course, is simply our daily physical needs, our sustenance, our clothes, our homes, our food. Uh, Paul told the Apostle Timothy, uh, the Apostle Paul told Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, verse 8, Having food and raiment, therefore let us be content. But there, that little short phrase there, give us this day our daily bread, really has several good lessons on that. <laughs> As David mentioned, we could make a sermon out of that, that one little phrase. But we ask for bread, not cake, not luxuries, demonstrating our total dependence on God to provide. So we ask for our daily bread, which teaches us not to take thought of tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. Matthew 6, 34. But constantly depend upon divine providence to take care of us. He says, then pray, give it to us. In other words, not to me only, but those in common with me. That should teach us charity, compassion, and concern for the poor and the needy. It hints also that we ought to pray with our families in our own households. We eat together, therefore we ought to pray together. Then he says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Our sins are our debts. And in fact, uh, the parallel passage in Luke chapter 11 uses the term sins rather than debts. In this model prayer, Jesus says for us to pray for forgiveness of sins. And again, we have to keep in mind these words were written for the disciples. They were for the believers, for the saved. For the unsaved, prayer will not result in the forgiveness of sins. Now we understand that we live under the new covenant and we must be obedient to the gospel to be saved, to receive the saving grace of our Lord, to have our sins forgiven. For it's only in baptism that one comes into contact with the blood of Christ whereby his sins are forgiven. In Acts 22 and verse 16, <clears throat> Paul is told now, says, why are you tarrying? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. In Colossians 1 verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, that's Christ's blood, even the forgiveness of sins. In 1 Peter 3 verse 21, the like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us. See, God has made provisions for by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, shedding that blood for the forgiveness of all sins. Sins that you've committed before you became a Christian, sins you commit after you're a Christian. According to the conditions, the conditions that we must meet. In 1 John 1 verse 9, it says, We confess our sins, and He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's written to Christians. All the Christian has to do is to have, to have their sins forgiven is to repent and ask God for forgiveness. And that sounds so lighthearted and easy, but the word repent is the, the catch there. It doesn't just mean, oh, well, I'm sorry I did that. No, repentance is turning away from that sin that you committed and determine that you're not going to do it again and admitting it to God and asking for his forgiveness. 1 John 1 verse 8 was again written to Christians. We say we have no sin. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And you notice also that forgiveness of sins is conditional upon you forgiving others. In Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. If someone sins against you and subsequently repents and you hold a grudge against them, forget it. God's not going to forgive you either. And he said, lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. Now, this, if this were a plea to God to not allow us to be tempted, that would not be realistic. More likely, this is a plea that our Father not allow us to be tempted by Satan above what we can endure. Jesus said for you to pray to not yield to temptation and be delivered from the evil. The temptation he's speaking of there may well be linked to the previous phrase which says, forgive me of my sins, may have to do with those sins. You've sinned, you've repented of them, you ask God to help keep you from doing that again. But regardless of sin, any sin in your life, the blood of Jesus Christ will forgive, will allow you to get back into the right relationship with God. And remember this, God does not tempt you. He doesn't tempt with evil. James 1, 13 and 14 uh, makes that clear. Where he said, let no man say when he's tempted that I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And of course, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able. So God doesn't tempt us, but he can allow us to be proved by Satan through temptation, trials, afflictions. He can shield us from it, and he can see to it that we're not tempted above what our ability to overcome it. You Think about the uh, Job as well as, as Christ, the temptations there in Matthew chapter 4. Job was able to overcome temptation. God gave him the strength to overcome trials and tribulations and temptations, even to his wife telling him to just curse God and die. You think that wasn't a temptation in his case? I'm sure it was. But God will see to it that you're not overcome by temptation if you'll just come to him in prayer. One of the passages that <laughs> holds a great deal of comfort for me is 2 Peter 2 and verse 9, when you really think about what he says. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. <laughs> God knows how to do it. And to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. That's totally within God's knowledge and his abilities. On your own, you cannot overcome temptation. You cannot overcome Satan. But by the word of God and the spirit of grace, you can. And Jesus says, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now, this part of the model prayer is not included in, uh, in Luke's account. But that doesn't mean that it's not inspired and that it's not important. Jesus started out by telling you to pray, honoring God's name in worship. Now he's telling you to finish up your prayer the same way. Cap off your prayer in the same way you started it, by honoring God for everything. God owns everything. The kingdom is God's. All power belongs to him. All glory and excellence of royalty is his. Acknowledge this in your prayers. Honor him for who he is and what he is. Then Jesus closes out that model prayer with amen. Amen just means simply, may it be so, or so be it, or I agree with it. So when you echo, when we have a public prayer and you hear people echo and amen at the end of the prayer, that's what they're doing is agreeing with the prayer. This is my prayer also. Now you may question why, if Jesus just ended it with a prayer, why do we usually end our prayers with something like in Jesus' name or in the name of Christ or by the authority of Christ. We say something like that before or during our prayer. Well, again, remember that this model prayer was given, just like uh, the prayer for the kingdom to come. This model prayer was given before Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and ascension back into heaven. 
Jesus was still with them in the flesh. And the Lord told his apostles that after he ascended, that they were to ask nothing, nothing further of him. John 14, verse 13 and 14, he says, Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. And again in John 16, verse 23 and 24, In that day you shall ask nothing. Verily I say unto you, you shall ask me nothing. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto for you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. So to ask in Jesus' name is to ask by his authority. So why are we to pray in Jesus' name or by his authority is the next question. Because we are unworthy of in and of ourselves to approach God in prayer. Jesus is our go-between, our mediator. So we are priests, but Christ is high priest. And he is the mediator between us and God's throne. Hebrews 4 and verse 14. Seeing that we have a high priest that is uh, passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession. 1 Timothy 2, 5, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 7, verse 25, wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So it's not by just human tradition or habit that somewhere in our prayers and when you hear a public prayer in the assembly you'll hear in Jesus name or by Jesus' authority that's not just a matter of human tradition it is by scriptural precept and examples the scriptural prayers must be addressed to God the Father through Christ the Son now, this model of prayer is so brief and broad that it leaves, leaves us wondering about a few other things. Now, don't get the idea that the model of prayer limits what you can petition God for, nor do you have to use every one of those items in every prayer that you pray. Just look at some of the examples that we have in the, in the New Testament of prayers that were offered. Um, Paul prayed for the Christians in Colossae to be filled with love. Uh, the, the disciples prayed for a, the successor of Judas. The disciples prayed for boldness in preaching the word. Peter prayed for the resurrection of Tabitha. The church prayed for Peter's welfare when he was in prison. And James 5, verse 13 and 14, 13 says, pray for the afflicted. And verse 14 says, pray for the sick. All of these, you're not limited to just those things in the, the model prayer. Like I said, that is a model, a broad, covering everything type of pattern. Now, We've considered who can pray and what we can pray for. Now let's look at how to pray. Now Jesus, uh, the, the Christian must first, of course, possess faith. He must believe that God is going to answer his prayers. James says in James 1, verses 6 and 7, Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For the, he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. But let not that man think that he will receive anything of the Lord. If you don't think God will answer your prayer, you're right, he won't. In Matthew 21 and 22, it says, All things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. And we understand that there are conditions on our prayer. And uh, we have to be in that right relationship with God. The Christian must pray, I, I call it submissively. In other words, willing to bend to God's will. 
Uh, 1 John 5 and 15 says, This is uh, the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. So we have to be willing whenever we ask God for something, we have to be willing to take his answer. And his answer may be, no, you can't have that. <laughs> A Christian must pay, pray humbly. That attitude of the self-righteous Pharisee in, is what God abhors compared to the humble publican there in Luke chapter 18. Only those who are poor in spirit, that is humble, will receive the blessings from God. Matthew 5 and verse 3. The Christian's prayer must be genuine uh, from, from the heart, heartfelt. That's why we get away from those memorized prayers. Uh, we fall into habits of asking maybe for the same things a lot of time, but we don't memorize a prayer. It has to be heartfelt. Matthew 6 and 5 says, When thou prayest, don't be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues, in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. That recognition they get is all the reward they'll get. They won't get anything from God. If you are genuine in your worship and praise to God, but if you're not genuine and you're trying to please others, you're trying to make a show, show people how much you know or how good a prayer you can lead, that recognition is all you get. Finally, the Christian's prayer must be unselfish. And I think this is so important. James 4 and 3 says, You ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your own lust. To pray purely for selfish reasons and not in harmony with God's will is to ask amiss. And the sure way to have your prayers unanswered is to ask for selfish reasons. Now in conclusion now, the, this brief model like I said, and it is very brief. Jesus offered is so beautiful, so concise, and more than anything else, it teaches us the proper attitude we must have in prayer. We can go to our Father with all of our petitions. There's nothing that we cannot petition God for. Philippians 4 and 6, we need to take that verse literally. Be careful for nothing. Don't worry about things. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. The inspired apostle Paul again wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, pray without ceasing. Now, I would urge you, brethren, to Take advantage of this great blessing. And it is a great blessing to be able to go to your heavenly Father in prayer, knowing that he hears you and he has the ability to give whatever it is you're asking for. Trust in God. Spend time in prayer. And the Lord will hear and bless you. Thank you. I appreciate your attendance this morning. Brother David, I'll turn it back over to you.